Okay, right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, warm welcome to uh, Joint Commissioning Board. Um, you may notice we've got a different layout today. We've gone back to the um, you know, more, more familiar style, which I think hopefully everybody was in agreement was the, was the right way forward. So it feels more natural to have a discussion when we're sat around a, a table, albeit a very big one. Um, but please do give feedback if, um, if you prefer the other style, but uh, hopefully this one will last. Um, I was going to do introductions, but we've actually got, everybody's got a nameplate in, in front of themselves, and there's a lot of us. So maybe to save time, we'll, we'll not um, uh, do formal introductions, but uh, a warm welcome. Um, in terms of apologies, uh, Lindsay? Yeah, hi, I'll note them. Is that all right? You'll note them, that's yep. fine. Okay. All right. Um, so in terms of uh, urgent business from myself before we kick off, um, so in terms of membership, uh, colleagues will be aware that Councillor Linda Thomas, who was our co-chair, has um, uh, stepped down since our last meeting. Um, so I would like to, on behalf of the board, you know, fully recognise Linda's input and um, uh, you know, thank her. For, uh, you know, we worked very well together, albeit for a very short uh, period of time. Um, as a replacement, we're in receipt of a nomination for uh, Councillor Brenda Warrington, who's uh, sat to my right here, uh, from Tainside Council to be elected into the co-chair role. So uh, the proposal is that at next month's JCB, um, we will uh, go through the formal business in terms of hopefully being able to appoint Brenda into that role, as well as reviewing um, more, more generally the, uh, the, the membership, and we'll run that as a, as a, as a mini uh, AGM. Um, I'd like to also welcome two new members to the board, Councillor Susan ben Baines from Bolton Council. Where are you, Susan? Hello. <laughs> welcome. Uh, and Councillor Jane Slater from Trafford Council. Welcome. Okay. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that we have a new Managing Director of the GM Joint Commissioning Team, uh, Rob Bellingham. Well done to Rob. Uh, he went through a... Um, due process in terms of uh, recruitment and uh, application uh, and interview and uh, I was very pleased to be able to uh, offer Rob the role uh, last Wednesday after his interview so I'm sure you'll all join me in congratulating Rob and look forward to working with him into the future. Okay, so great. Um, there should be a declarations of interest form being circulated at the moment. Lindsay, is it on its way around? Yeah, good. All right. If you, if you do have a, a declaration, uh, something you want to declare, please put it on the form. If you're unsure, please put it on the form, and then we can decide whether it is a true conflict or not. Okay, so the minutes of the last meeting, is everybody happy to uh, accept those and approve? Yeah. yeah. Okay. They're they're approved. Great. There's no actions specifically no. arising. Tom, can I, can I just make one very quick point? It's it's just um, for clarification, really. It's just a, it's just a governance point that in relation to um, minute eight nineteen, which is around the neuro rehab um, case, if we could just um, reflect that that does relate to level B business because that's an important part of the of the joint commissioning board's constitution in terms of the nature of that work, and similarly. The paper that we are going to consider <coughs> later on this afternoon about neuro rehab, there's actually a, a, a typo on the on the cover sheet because it talks about level A business and it is in fact level B business. Forgive me for the slightly um, esoteric governance point, but that does make a difference in terms of resolutions and minutes um, subject to approval later. Yeah. Sorry. Um, just wonder when the time comes, Chair, if we could ask Rob to <coughs> e explain to us all exactly what A and B means in this context yeah. so that we go into the discussion properly yeah. informed. Yep, no problem. We make a mental note of that. Can I, can I just ask everybody to make sure that their nameplate is sat in front of them rather than um, so that it will help me if I don't know your name because I like to use everybody's first name. So, John, the, the, the one next to you as well, please. Thank you. Um, yep. Chair. <laughs> okay so well, welcome to the meeting and, and that's why it's turned upside down so okay thank you okay so um moving on to our first uh, significant paper today which is our investment proposal into homeless health care and the uh, a bed every night scheme uh, andy's asked if he could attend for this particular agenda item so um <laughs> And, and may want to sort of contribute later in the discussion. Um, but this paper's been presented to us by Ruth Bromley. Is Ruth in the room? 
Oh, there you are. Sorry. So, can I? Th this is a real test of my chairing skills because <laughs> <laughs> there's about ten people I've assigned, and um, yeah. So, uh, without further ado, hand over to you, Ruth, please. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, this is slightly eclectic, and not everyone's preferred presenting style, but we're modelling co-production this afternoon, which is a mantra within homeless healthcare. Um, I should probably declare a conflict of interest that I have invested a significant proportion of my time in healthcare for our homeless population over the last three years. Um, and I'm going to speak first, and then Kath's going to follow me, and Martin's going to do the grown-up bit at the end. Um, so um, we did want to say that this has been a team effort. Um, there's been a working group that has met weekly since we agreed that we would take this piece of work forwards um, two months ago now. Um, so the paper you see in front of you really should have everybody's names on it because it's been um, a sequence of conversations and challenges and debates and important dialogue. Um, but also just wanted to say thank you to Helen, who has put an awful lot of time in at short notice and has come back time and again with a revision that does justice to the conversations that we've had. So thank you to that for that. We're also grateful to the combined authority for adopting a reflective approach um, at what started out as quite a you know, potentially difficult conversation. I think we all know that a bed for every night has taken a place um, in the offer that we have across the system for homelessness, but um, what we've appreciated is the ability to think about what good might look like moving forwards and, and to aspire for something really, really good um, at the end of the next 12 months if we go ahead with the proposal today. So grateful for that. And I think the thing that brought me back to thinking about a bed for every night as a very useful part of the offer within the system, appreciating that there are lots of components to what we're talking about when we think about homelessness, was that if you remember, we had sub-zero switch on, switch off of beds before a bed for every night. So we'd literally have patients sent back out into the pouring rain when it was one degree of temperature and then allowed back inside for a night because it was minus one. Um, and certainly that was happening in my first year within sort of getting grip on healthcare for homelessness. So I think for that alone, it probably does serve a purpose at the moment. Um, and I think we just wanted to then think more broadly about what we might offer um, from healthcare if we're to become involved moving forwards um, <coughs> with the totality of the offer for our homeless population, not just thinking about crisis um, points in the system. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about people who are experiencing homelessness and just to um, sort of share some mantras really from inclusion health because that's something that I've invested a lot of my academic time in over recent years. And there are two things that we say really repeatedly and the first is that people who are experiencing homelessness actually do really care about their health. They might not access services in the way that you or I would um, and they may not be able to engage in services in the way that the majority of our population might but actually when we sit and talk with people they really do worry and they do want to make changes in their lives and they do really value support with goal setting around changing their behaviours if it's around drug and alcohol dependence, if it's thinking about um, sort of trying to move forwards with their mental health. So we, we have a captive audience, it's just that sometimes the system doesn't deliver in the right way at the right time for people. And the other thing is that, that if we get it right for this part of our population, particularly at a time of deepening austerity, we actually stand to get it right for everybody. Because if we can sort out the barriers for our population experiencing homelessness, we're probably sorting out barriers for lots of other people as well, whether that's people who don't speak English as a first language, for example, or people who are frail and elderly and um, you know vulnerable and isolated in their communities. So some of the systems changes we can make for this population stand to serve a substantial um, part of our population, particularly when you think about our deprivation indices across Greater Manchester. We talked a lot about barriers and voices that aren't heard and about investing disproportionately and that we thought all of those things were good things and if we're to move forwards in the next 12 months that's certainly part of the conversation we need to have and actually the collective voice from our voluntary sector partners working in the um, night shelters and the other kinds of emergency accommodation they provide a very solid narrative about what good would look like here. It does um, raise one issue around the cost benefit analysis which we might want to discuss a little bit more because um, this is my very personal view, but I think that we might end up spending a little bit more, certainly in the immediate term if we do this properly. Uh, we can all say that we will save money in due course because we would hope that we actually reduce homelessness in the first place as well as dealing with um, sort of lifelong trauma and helping people to move forwards with their lives, but we're probably going to need to think about investing robustly in the immediate term, but be interested to hear views from the room. 
I think just to share some of the good examples of what we can bring if we do decide to work as a collective for Greater Manchester, in, in, and I can only speak from a Manchester perspective, and I apologise, but that is where I am invested in terms of my own clinical um, exposure to this. But we now have a hub and spoke model where we use urban village medical practice who are our CQC outstanding GP providers um, who are then supporting a collection of other GP practices who we have identified within hotspot areas, particularly where we have more bed and breakfasts and more temporary accommodation to upskill but also support primary care um, clinicians and um, nurses. GPs and um, you know the whole team really um, to provide the bespoke care that we can describe very easily but that can be very challenging to provide for people. We have good outreach and we have drugs and alcohol support now working with our um, city council colleagues providing outreach and it's that partnership working that makes all the difference. We've got tried and tested um, services from our voluntary sector partners such as Barnabas who provide a significant part of our nursing provision and we um, have a health and task and finish group which is attended by um, a very um, sort of broad range of partners from across the system in Manchester and we meet on a bi-monthly meeting to make sure that we're all coordinating and sharing resource and knowledge and up-to-date um, up ideas as we move forwards. And the principle around everything that we do is about co-production and working with people who are experiencing or have experienced homelessness. So just last week I was at our Homeless Partnership Board and we received presentations from our Women's Action Group um, and they so articulately describe the needs for women who are homeless as being very different perhaps to um, men who are experiencing homelessness. So, and they have the answers. We don't need to go looking for them. We just need to listen and engage properly. Um, similarly, thinking about receiving um, um, antipsychotic medication once you're on the streets, particularly if that's injectables. And again, just really, really sensible ideas and suggestions moving forwards from people who are actually needing to receive those medications. We're probably not gonna need to reinvent lots of things. What we need to do is pull this together. So that was my point really. Um, and the reason I've shared all that is that I don't think that most of this is new. I think there's lots of really good things happening across GM when we look at health, and um, particularly because people do have access to primary care at the point of demand, regardless of their immigration status or anything else. Um, so that there are some pockets of really, really good practice, but we know that we could be better. So there's something about consolidation, there's something about signposting, better connecting, and then thinking about what health might add in future discussions around adding leadership, knowledge, support, guidance, training, mentorship and education, certainly listening to people from the night shelters last week that we can offer a lot in terms of support and reassurance in the middle of the night, thinking about managing <coughs> withdrawal symptoms, thinking about managing people who perhaps have become quite disrupted with their mental health. And it won't be about us going in and delivering the care at that point, but it will be about us training up the other people who are working alongside to be able to support in a meaningful way. Um, the final point, just to make before I hand over to Kath, was about us wanting to widen the appreciation of homelessness as we talk about it. So yes, rough sleeping is a really visible part of the problem and something that is really, really worrying. And we know how much it upsets everybody to see that. But actually, we do need to start thinking about families and children and very much more about safeguarding adults who are facing vulnerability as we move forward. So I think that's something else that for those of us working in primary care settings, actually working alongside our families and children comes a second nature to us. And then wanting to think about prevention and the longer term, tackling exploitation, thinking about solving some of the problems that preempt people losing their homes, so domestic violence and thinking about a good core offer for GM in terms of people who are experiencing violence in their homes. Um, and then just to have a particular focus on children who are experiencing homelessness, because we know that that is the single biggest predictive factor for becoming homeless in later life. So I hand over at that point. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and I just want to echo um, Ruth's thanks to um, the combined authority for the work that we've done together on this. It really has felt a joined up process. It's really felt, um, I don't know why I was surprised by it, but it's really felt like we've been listened to, that we've really, really got to a different place than where we started. And so I think that that's a really positive thing and a good sign of where we might go with um, with uh, joint investment if that's agreed. Obviously Ruth comes at this from a Manchester and homelessness experience uh, position. I came to this very much from a GP position and I think although there's a big problem in Manchester there's clearly a locality problem in all areas of Greater Manchester as well and <laughs> in Stockport we definitely feel that and so I guess what I just wanted to kind of recount a little bit of the, the frustrations that um, certainly I've felt, and I'm sure the GPs in the room have felt, 
treating people who are homeless and who are uh, not in one fixed place. Um, and just, just through a couple of very general examples. Um, so, um, I mean, I think there is just a frustration anyway through um, seeing people that are moving on and not being able to starting something. I, I can think of so many examples of um, patients presenting with mental health issues, which clearly are a big part of um, a lot of the challenges around homelessness, starting to make referrals for patients. And at, at my practice, I'm looking after patients in a hostel just over the road from, from my practice. Um, these people, as Ruth said, these people experiencing homelessness still want um, the same things that everyone else wants, but just can't access it in the same way. Um, uh, and so um, from a mental health perspective, I, I've made referrals that then the patients moved on and, and so we've not been able to complete. And it just feels very frustrating to not be able to improve the outcomes of individuals in that setting. I had a really good example this week of um, a patient with psoriasis, who the, probably the worst psoriasis that I'd seen, who um, didn't want the creams that, that, that we could prescribe because he couldn't carry them when he moved on to his um, out of the hostel across the road. And so there's a real frustration, um, at, again, not being able to deliver both um, from a mental health perspective, but also from a physical health perspective, uh, the things that people need. Um, and I think really what, what that, I, I've also had patients um, that have become rehoused in my area and suddenly it takes on that different perspective of actually being able to action change and actually see the outcomes for patients and the improvements in their healthcare when they have an address. Um, and I think the other bit of it is I see in Stockport already some really good examples of collaboration across a pathway from health, from housing, from social care. And when that pulls together, it just feels so <laughs> different. So um, there's a, just emphasizing the point really of when that uh, pathway is produced collaboratively, we see something different. It feels like what the pathway needs to be looking at is a kind of end to end, you know, picking up that prevention of homelessness in the first place, identifying the factors that are putting people at risk and starting to action something different. It feels like we then um, have that opportunity of delivering safe healthcare to those people that are rehoused they're, or, or they're given a bed and then the opportunity of being rehoused and being able to deliver that safe healthcare. It doesn't stop there though, does it? Because as I said, those patients that then are rehoused still need a lot of support to stay in that setting. And so there is something really valuable about that whole pathway being redesigned. It feels like um, Aben's been a really good opportunity to start looking at this in more detail and certainly for us, for, for, certainly from my perspective, to get involved in something at, at a different level. And I think um, having health involved and having that, that um, funding to enable that health involvement really brings that voice to the table and hopefully has brought a useful perspective into the room um, that means that we can get that better offer and start to deliver health outcome, uh, different improved health outcomes for our population. Um, that's all I wanted to say, so thank you. I'll pass over to Martin. Thank you. Um, I'm sure people want to get into the debate and questions, so I'm going to be very brief because hopefully this paper is self-explanatory. It has been through a number of drafts. Um, just two points I want to make. The first one, I'm looking at Steve here, 6-2. Um, I just wanted to confirm that we've been through the CCG directors of finance and they confirm that if we agree it, um, the £1 million is available from the CCG uh, strategic levy. And secondly, in 6-4, just to draw people's attention to the assurance process there, and that assurance process has been a key part of the debate. It's not because we don't trust our partners, it's precisely the opposite. It's because we actually want to work and make a real contribution. It's a commitment and a signal of our commitment to this agenda. So, Tom, uh, no more to add. Thank you. Okay, that's great. So, I'm actually going to bring Steve in because can we afford it, Steve? Yes. Um, it went to Greater Manchester Chief Finance Officers last week and uh, Chief Finance Officers confirmed that the funding is available um, uh, from the GMCCG strategic levy. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, for what I thought were particularly passionate and clinically focused presentations, and, um, and I think that was brilliant and something that I'm hoping to see more of at, uh, at JCB, so other clinical chairs be warned. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we're going to wind it out for comments, questions, clar points of clarification. Okay, Steve. It's a question for Steve, probably. I suspect you'll pass it down the table. Uh, it's coming out of the, the proposal is to bring, take it out of the uh, levy. How much will that leave in the levy? 
there's about one and a half million pound left in the levy. The, the levy is overseen through the Greater Manchester Chief Finance Officers um, and that's monitored on a monthly basis. So there is funding still available for any things that arise later in the year. Thank you. Tom? Um, thank you. I thought it was a very, uh, very interesting uh, paper overall. Um, one observation and, and, and a question. Uh, 434, there's a sentence that says, um, you know, ensuring accommodation in phase two is safe and not detrimental to health. I'm sure it shouldn't have said, um, well, it might as well have said that, but perhaps phase one wasn't meant to be detrimental to health. But that's an interpretation. I'm, I'm particularly interested in 6.8, uh, which is the financing. Um, some innovative uh, ways of doing things. If this is going to continue long term, th there needs to be a presumably a different view about where the finance is going to come from. Um, not everybody will be able to donate £2 million um, year on year, perhaps. Um, so I'm just curious as to what plans there might be for looking at finances longer term. Okay. So, Martin? <coughs> Certainly. So I think the original part of this conversation was asking for recurrent funding. And a, a big part of the work we've been doing has been about the financing and the long-term financing of this. Um, we, we were very clear in the debate that at this stage we didn't want to come back to JCB and ask for recurrent funding. And the reason for that was not being clear enough about the model and wanting the opportunity to work that through and only come back for recurrent funding. We're absolutely clear we've got the right model in place. So that's the reason why we're coming back at this stage looking for non-recurrent funding to, to support this, to give it some um, financial footing because another part of this is there is a significant charitable um, investment in this, but actually at this stage, we're not, we're not sure what those numbers will look like. So this, this commitment gives it some surety, allows us to do that work, and allows us to understand the full quantum of funding that will be available. Okay, thank you, Martin, for that clarification. Warren? I'll start again. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ruth, and thank you, Kath, and everybody else that's uh, been involved in uh, preparing this uh, paper and all the hard work that's gone into it. Uh, we welcome and support this paper. Um, as you know, most localities already have a, a number of uh, initiatives uh, in all our localities, both to prevent homelessness and also support people who become homeless. I think, as the paper says, the evidence for supporting uh, the health and well-being of people experience, experiencing this homelessness is very clear and very compelling. So you can't argue with that, can you? Uh, I think it should be a key part of our commissioning strategy if you're actually serious about doing something about the inequalities of health that we have uh, in, in our localities and in GM. So it should be a, an important part of our commissioning. I think we support the, uh, the longer term plan because I think, the, uh, as, as the paper says, we must focus on prevention <coughs> and early health. Because I think, you know, a lot of it is crisis intervention. And I think we need to learn from that. Because I think, you know, focus and prevention, I would really support that. But I also hope that, uh, that this initiative moving forwards is a bit of a catalyst to uh, try and come up with some GM standards in terms of community services that we can all aspire to. So that to because, you know, when we look at this work, often it's patchy. There are some really good areas and some poor areas, and there's a lot of variation. So some GM standards in having these services like this would be really be helpful. At least we can hold each other to account and critically aspire to. So thank you very much, and we support it. Okay, thank you, Warren, for those words of endorsement. And, and I think I'd particularly like to emphasise the, the inequalities aspect, because they can... It must be, it's an absolutely huge inequality to have no home, and we should never forget that. Anthony. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair, and uh, 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 thanks for the presentations. I thought they were very powerful in bringing the paper to life, uh, and certainly um, sing to the endorsement that I want to give uh, to this paper and this proposal. But also, actually, uh, an ask. Uh, I think, uh, whilst I accept that the, uh, the, the funding is for 12 months, uh, I do wonder whether we could bring something back um, in six months' time to ensure that we, we don't leave this cold uh, and that we uh, have a, 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 a good update as to where the, the work has gone so that if we are able to make a commitment or not, as the case may be, in advance of 12 months, that we are able to do that. Because, of course, uh, all of us face uh, some difficult 
choices to make in respect of our forward planning uh, and being able to m uh, have sight of some of those choices sooner rather than later, I think would be really, really helpful. Certainly, I don't think we should leave this cold uh, without receiving uh, a, a, an update um, before the 12 month window is up. Yep, very sensible. And uh, Ian, are you going to build on those words? Uh, yep, thank you. Uh, I, I think the general comment is that this does feel like a real starting point, perhaps, for uh, joint working and joint um, uh, delivery of improvement between the Joint Commissioning Board and uh, the Combined Authority and other partners. It feels like, a, obviously, significant in relation to this subject, but, but potentially significant more widely. Uh, specifically, um, just building on certainly the last two or three comments, um, I think recognising that it is quite likely that there will be the need to have a longer term discussion about services and funding is um, uh, something that I think we should recognise. Uh, and therefore, in relation particularly to paragraph 6.4 and the assurance uh, process, um, uh, actually suggest that we should um, ask that, assuming we are going to nominate uh, people to be on the proposed board, that we receive perhaps a quarterly review of progress, if not to the JCB, then into the Accountable Officer Group so that we can understand and um, uh, try and support progress of this as well as picking up what some of the issues might be going forward um, and escalate uh, as necessary to the JCB. So perhaps a, a, a quarterly update to the Accountable Officers and reported as necessary into here might enable us to, to manage the next 12 months in partnership, but also to, to realistically think about what might follow that. Thank you. Okay, that sounds a very sensible suggestion around the um, CLG, what does it stand for? Commissioning, Commissioning Leadership, Leadership Leaders Group, yeah. uh, another uh, acronym. Um, for that to get quarterly updates from the, the, the project group, but I'd like to see it come back here in six months because you know, I think we'd all want to see where we've got to, so that if there is a recurrent funding ask, that we're, we're seeing that well ahead of the game. Um, Sarah, you're here on behalf of John today, so could I bring you in now, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say on John's behalf that um, the money that the partnership as a whole has been asked to commit to this project, um, half a million already, and an additional half a million, um, require sign-off at Partnership Executive Board on Friday. So where the intention is absolutely to support the work, um, it just formally needs that little bit of governance um, uh, before we can finally say that, that the million is committed as a whole to match the money that, that, that the JCB will sign off today. Okay, thanks. So, Lindsay, you'll have noted that for the minutes, please, and if we could all just make a mental note of that, uh, that would be great. Okay, if there's no further comments, I'm just going to take us... Yeah, to, to, to say very clearly that this scheme is an excellent scheme and should be supported because there's been a debate about whether it should be supported but that's simply been about the financial pressures elsewhere in the system you know the reality is that these in the longer term decisions on this are taken alongside decisions on SEND funding crisis children's funding crisis and and that's what we're facing and I think it's really important that the JCB recognizes that it, this is a scheme that we should be supporting it's the right thing to do but the pressure is about finding the money in that kind of context. Okay, thank you. Keith. <coughs> Thanks, Tom. I was just thinking in terms of this one-off funding, effectively, and yes, we need to look at it, but actually, <coughs> and they're all competing pressures on us, but actually the cost of not doing this is probably more expensive to the system, and actually we need to look at that. So it's going to be more expensive for all of us not to do this than it is to do it. And, okay, right, we're, we're going to run out of time on this agenda, right, so if we can make our contributions really quick. So, Ruth, you can say something very quickly, please. I, I absolutely get the point that there's a finite pot of money and we need to think about priorities, but I think the thing that always brings me up short is that if this was a physical illness with a life expectancy of 42, if you're a woman, <laughs> then we wouldn't be questioning where we were investing our money, so... For me, it's a very simple decision that we're making about investing where need is greatest. And that is a stark fact, fact isn't it? A 42-year-old um, life expectancy. Please. Um, 
So from Oldham's point of view, I'm very happy to support this. I think uh, this is a brilliant scheme. Uh, and the reason why I came a little bit late was because I was with uh, Andy Burnham launching the Greater Manchester Housing Strategy. Uh, and by the way, he gave you guys a, a big plug, so I'm hoping that you'll actually support this. <laughs> uh, <coughs> um, but, 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 but seriously, Chair, you know, in 21st century Britain, how can we have rough sleeping in our areas? I mean, that's the bottom line, isn't it? We can't not do this scheme. We have to do it for the right reasons. And the issue about finance, look, I'm the cabinet member for finance in Oldham. Do I understand the issues in local government? I do. Uh, my chief executive will tell you that. Uh, but the thing is, this is a, a, you know, an important priority. So we need to do it. But also, can I make a plea as well as bringing this back in six months' time? Can we also look at the alternative ways of doing this, which might be a bit, a bit more cost effective? So if you could add to that brief, that would be great. But completely support this on behalf of Oldham. And, and thank you for the support and the comments and the work that you've done in, in this area. Thank you very much. OK, great. Thank you very much, everybody, for the, those uh, very largely supported comments. And, and actually, uh, I think you know, people are saying, let's, let's try to do more on this uh, important agenda item. I think one of the key things for us, just to remember, there is, is this is the start of a process and not an end point. Um, we're, we're now firmly sort of wedded to the process, both in terms of financial investment, but also in terms of our commitment. Um, and I think that's key going forward. Um, and yes, we'll make sure we get regular updates. So let me lead, lead us through the recommendations. Because I think it's important just to um, uh, make sure that we agree to each of those. So the first is the investment proposition for £1 million from the CCG strategic levy on a non-recurrent basis. Are we happy to approve that? Thank you. Um, that we continue to provide support and leadership into this area. Yeah, we're happy to do that. Um, and also that we provide three nominated officers for membership on the GM Homelessness Programme Board. So firstly, are we happy to have three people on there? Yes. yes. And are we happy for those three people to be logically Ruth, Kath and Martin, as they're already firmly involved? So presuming that you wanted to be nominated. <laughs> <laughs> always, always good to uh, have an autocratic style, I find. <laughs> okay. Uh, and finally, in terms of the governance and updates, um, that um, the uh, Commission Leadership Group will get a quarterly update and we'll bring this back in about six months. So, so Andy, I know you've sat very patiently. I'm going to allow you a couple of minutes just to, um, to say a few words. I won't take more, Tom, but uh, it's just a massive thank you to you all, particularly Ruth, Kath. Um, I do want to say a particular thank you to Rob and Helen. You know, I know you've done a massive amount of work uh, behind the scenes. And I think, as people have said, we're on a journey with this, aren't we? No one is kind of saying that we kind of know everything. I think our understanding is better today than when I first came to the JCB to, to talk about it. I think we know that a bed every night is not right for everybody. It is right for some people. But obviously, we've got Housing First opening up now, which sits alongside it. So that is a strengthening of our offer. And even a bed every night needs to improve. It's variable. Uh, and you know, it, it, it can, we can learn as, as we go, go forward. But I think this is devolution in action, I, I might say, th what we're doing today. Because, you know, we're moving from a sort of approach where we're kind of managing health services to becoming a population health system, I think. And that's what this discussion really, really embodies. Um, and it's about partnership. So I want you to understand that this isn't just us coming to the health service and saying, you know, we're just asking you. I think we can confirm today that uh, Greater Manchester Police are going to be contributing uh, going forward. Uh, not on the same scale, but they are, because obviously there's a, an issue there in terms of the cost, Keith, that you were saying, of, of uh, not doing anything. Um, Ministry of Justice are contributing, um, uh, as well as the, um, the, the charitable contributions that we've got. Um, so it, we are building this, uh, this partnership uh, out. Um, just, just to finish, really, by kind of saying, I, I think the points that everybody's made are, 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 are right about you know, this is an issue that's it's the right thing to do, I think, as Steve Rumbler was saying. Homelessness is a health issue, isn't it? Uh, and it's particularly a mental health issue. The minute you're out, I think your health is suffering. So the question of whether or not we should do something, it's obvious we should be doing something. And it feels to me that what we're trying to do is create a support net that's kind of been damaged by austerity to kind of put it back uh, so that people can get on their feet as quickly as possible and hopefully from the platform that Bed Every Night gives them move move back forward again. 
I was with um, the mayor of Helsinki, and Abdul just just heard this. But I mean, it's really important to me for me to say this. I was asking him about housing first. This was last week, and he was saying it's not a project. Everyone seemed to think housing first is a sort of a narrow project where you kind of have a specific style of provision. And you, he was saying in Finland, it's a philosophy that if you don't have housing first, you don't have health. But actually, you don't. If you're a child, you don't have a good education. If you've not got a, a strong home be behind you, you know. If you're uh, older, if you've not got housing first that is right for you, you're not going to have a good life as well. You're not going to be supported. And I just think that is interesting, isn't it? And it goes back to Nye Bevan, Minister of State for Housing and Health, at the start of the NHS. You know, housing first, I think, is is something we should think about more broadly. I think than just homelessness. I think, as Ruth was was saying. Good housing is linked to children's health. It's linked to supporting older people in their homes and, and thinking differently about social care and how we work, work there. But I just think this is an important step that we're taking together. And it's a journey. We, we, we'll have to obviously keep working at it. Uh, but I think we are setting a new standard here today. And this is what devolution was always meant to be about. Greater Manchester having the ability to see something on our streets, to have the values that mean we can't just walk past it, and then say all of us together, well, what can we do about it together and come up with a better solution uh, together? And I think because of the NHS input, Bed Every Night's only going to get much, much stronger in terms of the quality of the support, as Ruth was saying, that we provide to people. And that's why I want to thank each and every one of you today uh, for the support you've given. Thank you, Andy. Uh, much appreciated those, uh, those kind words. Right, so I'm going to move us on. You're welcome to, to leave, gentlemen, if you, uh, if you can stay if you want. If you've got to say you're a rehab, you're welcome to. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. I should say you have to stay. <laughs> okay, so we're moving on to the neuro rehabilitation full business case. So, Steve, this has. Um, been something you've been working on for a long time, hasn't it? So today is a, is a key moment, hopefully, for, for us in this process. So um, if you could perhaps lead us through. Uh, but sorry, Rob's just reminded me. Before I, we allow you to present the paper, uh, Rob just wants to clarify level A and level B business. Yes. Just to clarify my slightly cryptic remarks at the start of the meeting, all business done through this board is class classified as level A or level B. Um, Put simply, level A business is business where we seek to do, um, we work through consensus. And if a level A decision, any CCG that doesn't agree with it or any, or any partner that doesn't agree with it is not bound to implement it. Level B business, which is the, what we're about, this next item relates to level B business, is something which actually is binding across the JCB members and it relates to the delegated decisions that we placed into this forum. Um, the criteria that we use um, cannot be implemented by the, by the harmonised actions of individual CCGs and or cannot be impl implemented unless it's implemented on a Greater Manchester-wide basis and or may be subject to a, a risk of legal challenge um, if, we did, if we did it in a, in a different way. So, so just for clarity, this relates to Level B binding business. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Steve, can I bring you in now, please? <coughs> Great, thank you, Tom. Um, so this full business case and the model of care for neuro rehab has been on a journey, I think it's fair to say. Um, we try to tot up how long a journey this has been. Um, I think it's been um, talked about in Greater Manchester for at least over 15 years to look at the flow of patients between our acute hospital neuro rehabilitation services. But more recently, over the past 18 months, the acute neuro rehabilitation process has been part of the improved specialist care program, what, which was theme three. Um, just to remind um, JCB that the model of care was approved by JCB in October um, last year. And in March this year, JCB approved um, that Salford Royal would be the single provider and JCB approved the site um, configuration of where the acute neuro rehab beds will be based. Those sites for the NHS beds remain the same in terms of Salford Royal, Stockport, um, Pennine and Trafford. So the sites stay the same in terms of the beds. What has changed, though, is the bed configuration in terms of one of the um, premises of this business case is to put more staffing and more funding into the NHS beds and which will enable us to be less reliant on our out-of-area independent sector beds. 
Um, I think that was Im important um, to note. So some of the bed um, configurations in our NHS beds will change. Um, they will be um, reconfigured to support some of those patients that are currently um, going out of area into the independent sector beds. Um, and they are for conditions um, for prolonged disorders of consciousness, um, abbreviated to PDOC throughout the case, and tracheostomy patients. We currently don't have NHS um, provision um, for to cope with those patients, they do go to the private sector. So this case for change creates NHS capacity um, for those patients that currently have to go out of area. Um, through the um, model of care process, um, there were four main areas that people picked up on, either through JCB or through the Joint Overview and Scrutiny Committee, um, focusing on um, wanting additional assurance um, when we, we saw the full business case today around travel analysis, equality impact assessments, um, interdependencies with the community near a rehab um, offer and more detail on the finances. Um, and each of those four areas are covered in the covering paper and the finances in a lot more detail in the full business cases. Just to quickly go over those four areas, in terms of the travel analysis, um, we did have Greater Manchester for Travel um, uh, looked at the, the travel um, impact assessment um, uh, and they concluded that actually journey times improve um, through this model of care as a result of fewer patients going outside of Greater Manchester. And in terms of the equality impact assessment, um, uh, Equality Diversity Development Services um, were the, the company that undertook the review of the Equality Impact Assessment, and that's appended um, in detail, um, but concluded that there were some recommendations that um, they said we should monitor as we implement the new offer and um, address those if they are real issues, particularly focusing on um, public transport, how difficult it might be to get to um, the four NHS units. Um, and if public transport issues can't be addressed, um, it recommends that the provider and commissioners uh, review alternatives, for example, um, taxi services uh, or alternatives to public transport. So that was one of the key recommendations that came out of that review. Didn't flag up any issues in terms of preventing us approving today. It said we should monitor the impact as we implement and address those issues if they um, arise. In terms of the community services, um, there was a full deep dive back to each of the 10 localities uh, and each of the directors of commissioning produced um, a, a form of words which have summarised in the appendix to the paper. I think it's fair to say that all 10 localities are committed to implementing the community specification and the standards. They are working towards the deadline of April 2020 to have that community offer in place. But I think it's fair to say that there are some barriers to implement um, the new model um, in terms of um, key um, workforce, potential shortages, particularly around some of the therapy staff. Um, so whilst localities are committed to working to that deadline, um, we have to keep monitoring that because I think um, it, it will be a challenging deadline for all of the 10 localities to meet. Um, four of the localities um, are almost at full implementation of the new model um, and a further um, four localities um, are going through the process of either approving the business case or starting the implementation from August onwards. There are um, two, maybe three localities um, who flagged up the deadline of April 2020 being particularly challenging. Um, and finally, on the money, um, the, the detail is in the full business case, but just to summarise um, the money, this model of care does save commissioners around a million pound um, as cash releasing <coughs> savings. It also helps prevent future growth in our private sector beds. So if you look at the, um, our dependency on those private sector beds out of area, they have grown from around four million pound two years ago to over six million pound this year. So over the space of two years, there's been over a 30% increase in independent sector beds. So this case hopes to address um, that future um, dependent, um, future growth on independent sector beds. Um, so it does save money in the future, but there's one million pound cash releasing. 
There is additional investment going into the NHS, so there's about three million pound extra going into the NHS beds for additional staffing, and that's offset by about a four million pound saving in the private sector. So that's where we get the net one million pound saving. Um, this business case is reliant on additional funding going in from NHS England uh, because some of the beds are commissioned by specialised commissioning um, and Sarah will um, uh, add to this at the, at the end. Um, there was an issue raised around um, capital and I think this is a lesson learned from when we um, look at all of the models of care that are going to come through the process. So whilst Neuro Rehab, we are keeping the existing four NHS sites, there is still a, still a requirement for a small amount of capital because some of the wards do need repurposing. Um, it's around £2 million. Um, there isn't any capital available nationally or at a Greater Manchester level, but this particular issue, Salford Locality, the CCG and Salford Royal have agreed to either fund that or resolve this locally as a result of the work that we're doing in our locality about, about re, uh, looking at the Salford Royal site. So capital is flagged up as an issue. For neuro rehab, it has been resolved, but I'm sure it will come up again as we go through the improved specialist care programme for all of the seven other cases for change as they come through. Finally, I just want to add in terms of the engagement process, there is an appendix to the paper um, that describes the um, meetings that this full business case has gone through. It's been through directors of commissioning, chief finance officers, um, provider directors of finance, and the specialist commissioning oversight group. And uh, a summary of the discussion points um, are captured in that appendix. Um, it's also been to the JCB executive um, and this paper comes with a recommendation from all three groups in terms of JCB executive, chief finance officers and directors of commissioning. So that's all I wanted to say. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Steve, and thanks in particular for pulling out those key elements that were, um, we required further uh, investigation after March's JCB. Um, Sarah, can I bring you in straight away for a comment? Because I know, again, you, you're here on John's behalf, and John does have a, uh, an ask of him, doesn't he? So um, the requirements um, for John as Chief Officer is to make the decision about the specialised elements of this business case, and he's given me the delegated powers today to take that decision on his behalf, which he's happy to support. And I suppose just to reassure um, JCB that the Specialised Commissioning Oversight Group, who looks at um, all the work that we're doing around specialised commissioning, have also reviewed this case um, from a specialised point of view with Steve and um, have gone through it and are happy to recommend this to John. So um, I'll be able to make that decision on his behalf today. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I thought it was important to get that clarification now. Um, so I'll open it out for wider discussion. Stephen, I know you want to come in straight away. Any other colleagues? Thank you. This is just um, um, a couple of specific points. I mean, uh, first of all, very much support the um, <coughs> full business case and the presentation that Steve, you've given. Um, just a couple of points. Um, really welcome the fact that actually you explicitly made the point that actually it had been through directors of finance, directors of commissioning. I suppose I've said in this room before, and I, I probably would just want it uh, to, to, to make the point again, but actually I think when we get reports like this coming forward in the future, it would be very helpful if we've got an explicit... Uh, comments from directors of finance and from directors of commissioning so we can actually see uh, firsthand exactly what they're saying so that would help us enormously I think in that context um, and my second point really um, my second point it re relates to um, 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 uh, the point you made in terms of um, uh, the community offering the standard um, so I think um, uh, this is a, I think a very good example of a, of, of a way in which JCB works going forward uh, I think it's very important that actually in the context of this body, 10 localities coming together, that absolutely we need to hold ourselves to account uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of those standards. But absolutely what I wouldn't want to see is this becoming part of any NHS assurance process uh, going forward. But this is something that we'd have to do for ourselves in terms of making sure that we collectively support each other to make sure we're delivering upon the standards that we set for ourselves. And I think that's such an important principle going forward in terms of the JCB, uh, but actually we do it for ourselves rather than actually uh, end up getting wrapped into some sort of like uh, top-down assurance process, which I know has been alluded to previously, but I know would not want to see that. I think it's actually really uh, incumbent on not each of us to make sure that we collectively support each other in delivering that standard for ourselves. 
Okay, so I might bring us back to that point around the community aspect to um, the, 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 the work and investment that's going on because um, because that is challenging as Steve uh, alluded to in his presentation and, and, and we, we do want to support each other but ultimately um, hold each other to account. Um, any colleagues want to come in? Anthony, please. Uh, yeah, so first of all, um, I just want to thank Steve and all of the individuals that have been involved in this piece of work because as you can see, it uh, uh, is, uh, is a complex piece of work that has been uh, in development uh, over a large number of years. But I think we should reflect on the fact that actually since the establishment of the JCB, we've now been able to catalyze uh, decision making collectively uh, on this. Um, so I would fully support uh, and encourage you all to uh, support this business case. I do agree with Steve, though, that uh, there is an intrinsic codependency here with the development of community neuro rehab services, which aren't part of this business case. This business case is about the redesignation of acute beds. Uh, but unless we collectively deliver the standard of community neuro rehab uh, that the model of care expects, then the output of the re uh, redesign of the acute neuro rehab model will be suboptimal. Uh, and so uh, I would, if we are to avoid uh, this uh, entering into some type of um, top-down review process that I know we would all want to avoid, we do absolutely need to make good uh, on the delivery of the community neuro rehab model that the uh, uh, that, that is described within the, the, the model of care. Uh, but as far as this uh, business case uh, goes, uh, I would urge us all to strongly endorse it uh, and also to note, uh, and I will allude to it in the next agenda item, that actually this is a bit of a dry run, uh, frankly, uh, for some of the perhaps more contentious and bigger decisions that we, are, uh, w that we will face uh, through the rest of the improving specialist care programme. So there is learning that I'm sure we can all take and, and, and comments on that very helpful. Okay, thank you, thank you, Anthony, for those words of uh, support and challenge around the community aspect. So um, I've got Ruth coming in next, and then John and Steve, please. Um, thank you. So no problems with what's presented to us. It was more an observation. Well, two now, actually, now Anthony's spoken. So I think we do just need to be aware, I agree with supporting each other, but these are quite specialist roles, both in the community and in hospitals. So there is a finite workforce that we're all going to be trying to recruit to. So, you know, I think there needs to be some further conversation about that when we get to the community discussion. But that, my point was really an observation, and it applies equally for the next paper um, around a quality impact assessment and just how artful we actually want to be as a system, because I can see we've met statutory requirements, but in my spare time, I'm doing a national piece of work around LGBT affirmation in healthcare and the um, ability to be much more sophisticated around how we look at our populations that we're caring for would be better or could be better. And the reason I've spoke to it for this paper around your rehab is if we think about people who are spending long periods of time in hospital and uh, perhaps of a generation where being gay was illegal, they will often go back into the closet during their time in a hospital setting because of the pressure they feel um, not to reveal um, their sexuality. So for me, a sophisticated impact assessment here would factor in some of those things. There are some really pivotal national documents around end-of-life care for people from LG, B and T communities, and we could actually be really um, quite positive and proactive in terms of the national agenda around that. We have people like LGBT Foundation in our midst, um, so, you know, to be utilising them perhaps more in the rollout rather than at, at this stage, but I just think we could take that further. My final point, and it's an issue with the quality impact assessment as written in a statutory way, is that it doesn't include financial hardship. And if we go back to the first paper we <laughs> shared this afternoon, actually there's a significant number of our population in Greater Manchester who suffer significant financial hardship. So again, the artful, perhaps rather than just the necessary, around how we really think about the people that are going to be in those beds, sometimes for quite long periods of time. Thank you, Ruth. Some good comments there, which have been uh, noted. Thank you. Uh, John. Uh, thanks, Chair. And uh, thank you, Steve, and everyone who's involved. It has been a long road, and here we are. Um, I think uh, Ruth got to my point first, but it's worth repeating. Uh, this is going to need 
a, uh, a, rec a large recruitment round when we're not quite in the phase of having grown our own yet. And so in terms of this being a first uh, go at this coordination across GM, I think it is worthwhile us understand the scale of that problem. And I would look to docs and the CFO groups to have some level of coordination. So we have to upscale, uh, we have to find another 80% uh, of, of workforce in order to sort of fill the post that, that we are uh, aspiring to do. Now, if one locality gets to full recruitment before any other locality, we don't win. So we will need to have some coordination about that and be mindful of how uh, previous employment patterns go across the localities. So in the Northeast sector, in Thameside, we sometimes struggle more to fill some of these posts. And I think if we're going to be real, it's not about sharing the money, it's about sharing the workforce, which is the real rate-limiting rate step. So I'd, I'd be grateful for docs and those sort of groups to support that process. Thank you, John. Steve, it's sort of developing that point and picking up on the, the dry run that this represents to some extent as well. On the community codependencies, when we see the, the, the next um, business cases come forward, I think it would be helpful to see a little bit more detail that identifies, from a transparency point of view, what the particular issues are going to be in terms of implemented community services. And I'd like to also have a, at least a view on the costs, because it's okay saying that the, what we're doing with um, specialist care is saving us 1.1 million pounds. I know it's not all about the money, but I guess that it will be costing us money to put in place some of these community services. So I think, just think we need to try and, as a JCB, see these things in the round as far as we can. Okay, thanks, Steve. I'm gonna bring Stephen, I don't know if you have any particular comment that you want to make about the, the community aspect. I know this has been a long time in the pipeline. Yeah, no, no, I think, I think that's spot on. This is just looking at it from the lens from the hospital um, um, side. Uh, it doesn't include the additional investment that localities are, ha are making in community. Um, the decision around the community near where we have specification was made before we embarked on this hospital um, case for change, which is why it's been kept separately. But there, there has been significant investment that localities have made in community services that we don't need to lose sight on. And, and rough and ready, I think it's, it's at least um, four to five million pound across Greater Manchester um, additional that's been added into community services. Okay. Thank you. So if, if there's no more comments, I'll just try to quickly summarise. So um, thank you, Steve, for the focus on um, uh, around equality, uh, travel impact um, that was asked from uh, the meeting in March. I think that's been um, quite clear. Um, I, th I think there is a challenge around the community aspects of this and um, supporting each other whilst uh, holding to account isn't always a particularly helpful term, but you get the gist of what I mean. So I'm going to suggest that in terms of taking that bit forwards, that that's something that the commissioning leadership group should look to pick up as to outside of this meeting, how we can uh, best uh, um, uh, ensure that uh, it, all that happens in terms of the community provision. A um, couple of key points. So, you know, we are returning uh, investment that's currently in the private sector out of area into the NHS in Greater Manchester. So I think that's a, a really positive move. Um, and we are reducing the number of people whose needs can only be met outside of Greater Manchester. So, uh, you know, a couple <coughs> of key, key points there just for us to emphasise. So if colleagues are ready and happy, let's go through the recommendations. Um, so the first was to note the contents of the report and those updated areas, which we do. Uh, are we happy to approve the full business case for neuro rehabilitation services? Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Well done, everybody. That's, <laughs> that's our first really big decision. So uh, that's uh, ever. <laughs> Second. <laughs> oh, yes, the first was the one before, wasn't it? Right, brilliant. So let's move on to our next paper, which continues the theme around improving specialist care. And uh, Anthony, I think you're going to lead us off on this uh, agenda yeah. item, please. All right. Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. And um, uh, this afternoon, I'm joined by Dr. Christina Walters, who's the Programme Director for uh, Improving Specialist Care, uh, and indeed a colleague from uh, NHS England, Tim Barton, um, who I said I was going to describe as an expert on uh, uh, 
NHS England reconfiguration processes, but he said, don't call him an expert. So uh, he's, he's a specialist, I think. <laughs> So uh, I'll assume you've all had an opportunity to read this paper, uh, and I think it is important that it is presented in the context of what we have just seen uh, in terms of the neuro rehabilitation uh, business case. Uh, so uh, as Steve rehearsed, uh, neuro rehab um, uh, is or has been uh, tested uh, as a model, of, uh, model for change uh, with agreement to the model of care uh, uh, agreement to the preferred option, uh, and uh, you have just seen the full business case for final endorsement. Uh, and of course, that has been tested uh, along the way by both discussion at the Joint Overview and Scrutiny Committee, uh, and of course, through the NHS England uh, uh, overview uh, oversight process uh, to ensure that we not only have appropriate engagement uh, and compliance, uh, but that the business case stands up. Uh, now, of course, neuro rehab is a, is a relatively small but important service, uh, but the principles of that process will remain the same for the remaining seven specialties uh, that we will see uh, now come through uh, the pipeline of the Improving Specialist Care Program. Uh, so the paper just articulates that, uh, just a reminder of the uh, informal workshop that we held uh, on the 21st of May, and thanks for colleagues uh, who participated in that, uh, at which we received feedback from patients and the public on the models of care. Uh, of course, those models of care which have previously been seen uh, and approved by the Joint Commissioning Board. Uh, the rationale for the site options uh, as we are developing them, uh, the, uh, uh, a view that we had to do some uh, and are now doing some more work uh, on both the orthopedics and cardiology models of care, uh, but also a, a recommendation that we now phase the program, uh, particularly uh, in relation to uh, the five uh, remaining specialties, uh, a number of which are facing very significant uh, resilience issues. And if we are to avoid unplanned uh, and uh, emergency changes to service, then it is important that we continue the momentum that we have so far uh, delivered. Uh, you'll see in paragraph 3.2 that we are now uh, undertaking a uh, piece of work uh, particularly around the four remaining options uh, around breast services to, in more detail, understand the clinical perspectives on the, clinic on the fragility uh, of, that, of those services, the impact on out-of-area patients, uh, a consideration of estate issues, uh, and, of course, travel time analysis. And subject to uh, the successful completion uh, of that work highlighted in 3.2, uh, we will be bringing uh, with, the, uh, subject to that information being fully and properly available, we will be presenting a paper to JCB in July uh, to support a future final decision on a preferred option. Uh, so I think what you're asked to do is just to, uh, this. Uh, I think given the uh, nature of the status of the program and where we are currently at, we just wanted to ensure that you are all collectively uh, up to speed with this uh, and to secure your uh, ongoing confirmation uh, of uh, your support to proceed. Um, uh, but also, uh, with, the with the help of Tim, just to give you an insight, uh, a, a very brief insight into the uh, NHS E, NHS I uh, process uh, that uh, oversees uh, and that will oversee uh, some of the uh, changes to services that we are proposing or potentially proposing subject to your agreement through the uh, uh, Joint Commissioning Board. So I'll pause there and perhaps um, uh, ask Tim to uh, go through his uh, slides, uh, which he's promised to do in five or six minutes uh, before we uh, open it for discussion. Uh, thank you, Anthony. And um, I note the two references to doing this quickly, so uh, I shall do so. Um, so there's a few slides here, and, and please don't let your hearts sink. There's not many. I intend to go through this at a fairly high level, but um, 
very happy to come back or provide further detail if there are kind of issues that raise or, or people uh, want to pick things up afterwards. Um, so, what on earth are we talking about? So, there is a service change assurance process led by NHS England, now NHS England and NHS Improvement, um, which helps bring the, the two perspectives of the organisations together. The reason this process exists is not because we love putting people through a bureaucratic machinery, it's to mitigate the risk of successful challenge of schemes. So this really exists to try and support you to make the change happen. That's our starting point with this. Um, I won't go through everything that's on the slide, the slides can be circulated afterwards, but I think fundamentally um, we want to test that proposals that are going to be put into the public domain are strategically coherent, that we're doing the right things. We want to test that they don't have wider system implications that haven't been thought about, but fundamentally we want to make sure that you have the best chance of making the change that you're proposing and making it stick. So things can be challenged, as we all know, by stakeholders, by referrals to the Secretary of State, by judicial reviews. In all of those scenarios, the question will be asked, did you go through the right process? Did you do the right things in the right order? How did you come to the conclusions you can come to? It's not failure to be challenged, but it is a failure if that challenge is successful. So this process exists to try and mitigate that risk of successful challenge. And I, I've been saying this for a number of years now, and I think I'm still fairly confident in saying it, that no process that's been, no program, sorry, that's been through this process has successfully had a JR or referral to the Secretary of State that's undone the recommendations. So, you know, it exists for, for good reason. I'll just quickly trot through kind of what the program looks like. Um, a key word on there is proportionate. You know, this process is proportionate to the scale of the change that we're talking about. Um, and we'll come on to how we make those judgments in a second. Um, the fundamental things that, that we need to talk about today, there are four tests for all service changes. Even the smallest service change, those four tests should apply. Um, a couple of years ago, NHS England introduced a fifth test, which was around where we're reducing bed numbers, just seeking some assurance that either alternatives are in place or um, there are specific uh, categories of admissions that will be reduced, so that will all make sense. So those are the, that's our starting point for assurance, checking those things. Um, you'll recognise that there are some fairly major things not in there, like finance, and we'll come on to that in a minute. So there are some other checks as well, but that's, that's the kind of do minimum. These are the things we think about when we think about what level of assurance do we want of something. So um, you can see a series of, uh, of factors down the centre of that slide and then a sliding scale kind of from right to left. If you're more towards the left end, so your larger scale, you've got more organisations, potentially more contentious, you know, a greater impact on other systems, we're going to require a greater level of assurance. So hopefully colleagues can see that that's a kind of pragmatic approach to this. This slide looks awful. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd like to claim it was someone else's work, unfortunately it's mine. <laughs> um, the key bit is the, the two red squares in there. There are two stages to this process, that's all we need to focus on really. That maps a whole service change process from somebody having a good idea right through to a final decision. That's why it looks so complicated. The bits we're talking about are those two red squares. So we have something called a strategic sense check. That's an early conversation with the program leads to say, can we review the case for change? What are the options been looked at? What's the proposed kind of handling of that? And that's where we would begin the conversation about what level of assurance is likely to be required. So that happens. Hopefully, you know, that begins the conversation to get full system organizational support behind a set of proposals. We come to a second stage, which is where a pre-consultation business case would be reviewed. That's where potentially clinic senate, clinical senate views might come into things. And that's where there's a formal decision by NHS England and NHS Improvement as to whether um, proposals will be supported to progress to consultation or otherwise. So quite a messy slide, but hopefully those two bits are, are the two bits that we, we need to focus on. I mentioned money. Um, I think the thing to flag here is to say um, schemes that require capital, there's been uh, much more of a focus on assuring that that capital is firstly available, secondly affordable before proposals can progress. So that's, that's one of the things we'd be very keen to check. Um, and as you'd expect, kind of, you know, the affordability of the proposals as well needs to be looked at uh, in some detail. Um, this is um, the program's slide uh, that Christine has supplied me. Thank you very much. And um, the point to make here is that everything I've talked about has been taken into account in this roadmap. So we're having the conversation at the right time. 
and we're progressing this kind of iteratively um, and we intend to carry on working in that manner. So you'll see at the kind of top left hand corner as we begin this, um, this journey, there's talk there of the strategic centre check and then later down the line, the formal assurance process. So this has been factored in and that's really pleasing to see because um, we're having the conversation at the right stage. So I'll pause there, hopefully that was helpful and happy to pick up kind of any immediate questions there might be. Okay, so thanks to Anthony and Tim for your uh, presentation. So uh, let's open up any comments. Jeff. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Just wondered, um, first of all, whether this process is mandatory or, op or optional. Um, how does it fit with the GM devolution agreement and the specifics about accountabilities in the agreement? And in the, the fifth test about bed loss, um, is there any test in relation to fit with other changes at the locality level? particularly in community services and all of our major acute service changes, we've been really clear we have to fit with wider service changes that make sense to people and politicians at locality level. Didn't see that. And I just wondered, finally, you showed the roadmap of our test. Um, is that um, a duplication um, or is that an additional test? Sorry, I just didn't catch the last bit there. Well, your last slide showed the, the roadmap of the process we've adopted for our major service changes. And you were saying that that seems to tick all the boxes of the national test. Does that mean we've got two tests that are doing the same thing? Or um, is, are you going to delegate to us the ability to use ours rather than yours? Um, OK, thank you. So. Um, uh, to answer those in turn, um, this is uh, a process that um, uh, CCGs are, all, all service change in NHS England's view is led by commissioners. Uh, so even when it's you know, primarily a provider-based thing that we'd expect it to align with commissioning intentions and therefore commissioners are having that conversation with us. Um, the assurance process, it's expected that commissioners would go through that before um, consultation so that we'd ensure that we had full system support um, before we have that. I think colleagues in the room have been involved in, in previous large-scale schemes in Greater Manchester um, and have seen the benefit of having gone through an assurance process when things have been challenged. So um, we've got a kind of way of working established um, that involves this process. The fit with devolution has been discussed um, with the uh, Health and Social Care Partnership and it's been agreed that we will continue to work in this way and that these, these are things that we will continue to apply to proposals that are coming forth from Greater Manchester. I think primarily because the benefit has been seen from that previous experience of having gone through this and, and kind of the risk mitigation that occurred. Um, your question about community services is, is absolutely spot on and that's one of the things that we'd want to draw out that isn't in those five tests that we talked about explicitly, but absolutely is part of that sort of strategic coherence thing. So, you know, we want to make sure that a set of proposals for acute services are absolutely underpinned by the right infrastructure or change if necessary in primary and community services as well. So that's one of the things that we'd look at through this process. Um, and finally, other two sort of sets of rules or just one on the roadmap thing. No, absolutely, sorry, if I wasn't clear, the point I was making is that that roadmap incorporates those two stages that I talked about. Um, and we'd look to work alongside you to make sure that that's a seamless trip through there and that this doesn't introduce kind of you know an extra stage or some sort of um, problem along the way okay thanks Jeff do you want to come back on that <coughs> might need a separate conversation but where we've been through major service change in the past there comes a point when the question is asked who's got the authority to say yes or no we go through all these processes to protect ourselves from legal challenge and it's absolutely right we must do but I'm still not clear on the back of this presentation when it comes down to, to the final decision, do we go or not go? What authorities does Greater Manchester have? And okay, I'm going to bring Anthony on this. Yeah, so, so I think it's fair to say that um, the, uh, the uh, 
arrangements for the oversight of major service change have iterated over the most immediate period, particularly, over, I'd say, over the past couple of years. Um, uh, and certainly since, I would say, uh, the decision around Healthier Together. Um, so I, I think the answer is that ultimately it's a C where, where, where this is around health services, ultimately the decisions are CCG decisions in Greater Manchester. Ult ultimately they are CCG decisions. Of course, for some of these services there will also be a specialist commissioning element, uh, I think particularly for vascular. Uh, ultimately though, uh, uh, similar to the decision we just made on neuro rehab, this will be a CCG and uh, delegated decision around specialist commissioning. I suppose the, uh, the reason uh, that we are, if you like, running also with the NHS, NHS England, NHSI process uh, and oversight uh, is to give ourselves assurance that we are doing exactly what you did in your comment, which is to minimise the risk of challenge. Um, because I think these are tried and tested, in, uh, in particularly in other parts of the country, methodologies for... Uh, as Tim has suggested, pushing back uh, where there may be legal challenges to processes that involve significant service change. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Are we, are we happy to move on? Yeah, okay, so I'm going to bring Ian in and then uh, Noreen. Uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, Anthony, thanks for the update report and uh, thanks as well for your offer of further local discussions about elements of this. I think we've got a session next week in Manchester and particularly what you were describing about phasing of the programme, I think, is, is one of the subjects we'll be looking to, to, to discuss further, so looking forward to that. Um, second is more of a comment, and it, frankly, it does follow on from, from Jeff's uh, questions, and it, um, it is true, as, uh, as Tim said, that there are some of us in the room who have got long memories on um, some of these uh, assurance processes, and uh, it, it, it's too complex a subject, probably, to get into in full detail here, Tom, but if I may just make the following comment, that um, when we did do uh, the Healthier Together progress process, it was uh, formally decided by the then 12 CCGs, um, and it was challenged uh, in a judicial review, and we did successfully win that judicial review, so you're absolutely uh, right. And frankly, in part, that was thanks to the NHSE process. Um, frankly, it was also partly... Um, despite some elements of the way in which NHS England applied their process and the, therefore there are considerable lessons to learn from that. Um, the, one for, the one relevant comment I'd add is that um, such was the strong feeling about the way in which we, we worked at that time that um, questions were raised at the highest possible level in NHS England about this and frankly it was one of the triggers for GM devolution to start back in 2014, 2015. Um, so um, it's good that we're working closely together and we should continue to working closely together. Um, but you know, I was receiving late night phone calls from NHS England the night before we were due to go out for public consultation um, with uh, further concerns about the proposed process. So we need to try and ensure that we get our ducks in a row early as possible so that we avoid that sort of last minute um, potential hiccup. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Health points, Noreen, please. Thank you. Um, I guess it can stop, but we obviously also welcome the opportunity to discuss this locally. I, I was just going to make a, a kind of more general point around um, just, I guess, reminding ourselves of the reason for doing this, which is about improving the quality and sustainability of services. And since this process, more recent process, has begun, people will be aware of the decisions we've already had to take in Stockport around breast surgery services. And um, it won't be the first or the last where we're having to make decisions in more of an unplanned way. And if that isn't an example of how we need to work through this process, then I'm not sure what is. Um, so it's a just a stark kind of reminder and a sense check in the reality. Of course, we need to have due process and due governance, but at the same time, when we're faced with crises in our services, we're having to make these decisions anyway, and they're not the best decisions to make in that unplanned way. So just, um, just to bring us back down to reality, whilst we 
continue to go through the process, we are having to make decisions about some of these services already. Thanks, Noreen. Sue? I'll be quick because I'm supporting Noreen's point. Um, we work across Bolton, Salford and Wigan, um, and the three trusts there have had to work very closely on two of the services mentioned for prioritisation, which are breast and benign neurology, in order to make interim decisions to keep services safe and sustainable while workforce issues um, continue. And so oh, I wholeheartedly support prioritisation so that we can keep pace and support those services to move forward in a more planned way. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, partly reiterating that point about pace is necessary, but putting the counter position against that, that while we do need to move quickly, where there is a need to consult, we need to consult where there are genuine choices. And we need to be careful of some of our language. Some of this within the paper starts to describe before we've, any of these assurances have made that we've made a decision. And I want to be careful we make the decision at the right point in this process rather than at the very beginning, because then any consultation or engagement becomes less less meaningful. The, the, the second point is maybe picking up some of the points coming out earlier of this, that through our assurance mechanism, we are looking at eight pathways individually. And then maybe needs to be also that step back. We, we discussed it earlier with the, with the capital within the Salford, uh, with the capital of the neuro rehab where Salford have found the solution for that. There are increasingly probably some interdependencies beyond those around the individual clinical pathway. But in terms of the interdependencies around the, the corporate entities, the interdependencies around the place, our health and care systems are big employers. They are the provider of skilled jobs in places and our healthcare systems need to change. It's something we've all um, signed up to do. But we need to make sure we look across all eight changes to make sure we don't accidentally destabilize things we weren't anticipating, which might be the case we do it individually. Um, I'm thinking about particularly the Simon Stevens uh, speech recently at the um, Faculty of Medicine about the carving out of d district general hospitals. We need to make sure that we leave resilient health, health and social care systems in our 10 places, which are different, which are transformed, but which remain functional. Right, thanks, um, Tim. Actually, I think almost an excellent summary of where we, we need to get to. So what I've, what I've heard from around the table is continuing support for this programme. We need to follow due process. We need to minimise risk, but we also need to consider prioritisation because some services are more at risk than others. So we've got to just try and manage both uh, <coughs> parts of that equation um, sensibly and safely and ultimately avoid destabilisation. Okay, so we note the contents and you have our ongoing support and we look forward to July's JCB where this will be looked at in more detail. Uh, Stephen, I, I noticed you've arrived, so perfect timing. Um, we're pretty much on time for your paper, so if I can suggest you give us a five minute introduction to your paper, kick, picking out the key points, and then we can get into any discussion, please. Okay, thank you. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know me, I'm Stephen Kennedy. I'm the Strategic Financial Lead at The Partnership, and I'm here today to talk to you about the, um, an element of the Theme 4 work on corporate services, which is the establishment of uh, the wonderfully titled Corporate Services Delivery Vehicle. Um, members um, should recall that uh, colleagues of mine um, sort of during last year um, came to to joint commissioning board to sort of set out the sort of plans um, we brought a, um, a strategic proposal forward for um, sort of consolidating the current greater manchester shared service and looking to um, to sort of uh, stabilize and sort of um, put that organization on, onto a sort of footing that we can sort of move forward with. And uh, we got a lot of support uh, around the table and from um, sort of CCG colleagues and others um, to do that. And I thought, I th I think at that point, um, um, JCB asked us to sort of continue to sort of update on, um, on, on sort of progress. Um, the, the sort of pack of papers that I believe you've had is, is a, a sort of short report. Um, the, the slide deck and the um, updated, what we are calling target operating um, sort of model. So what have we done um, sort of uh, 
recently. We've completed a, uh, a number of pieces of work um, associated what I would describe as uh, due diligence. Um, we both for GMSS and for those who are not familiar, ELFS is the East Lanx Financial Services, um, who do provide a number of sort of shared services to largely uh, the GM providers and others, not just in this neck of the woods, but uh, in other parts of the NHS. Um, and we've completed um, that due diligence. Um, that sort of culminated in, um, in, in us um, sort of providing a, an update through the partnership, uh, a request for an update through Partnership Exec Board um, to look at the governance. And, and I'm going on Friday um, to the Partnership Exec Board to, to give that um, update. Um, thankfully, the um, East Lanx Financial Shared Services Management Board um, sort of endorsed the transfer of East Lanx Financial Shared Service into um, the sort of delivery vehicle. Um, and that, that, from my perspective, is, is, is a sort of major step forward. We are right in the middle of um, selecting the host. And um, in fact, we had um, a session with, um, with one of the uh, potential hostees um, yesterday. And we're just sort of finalizing uh, a number of uh, issues associated with that. I was hopeful that we may be able to do, announce who that is, but we haven't concluded that yet. Um, so given um, the, the nature of this sort of session, it wouldn't be right of me to, to sort of make that uh, announcement. Um, we've completed the, the sort of target operating model, and, and I'm quite happy to take some feedback from the, um, the, the committee, either in meeting or outside around that. I'm really, really sort of uh, pleased to, to also say that we've been able to secure um, sort of uh, investments um, through, at this stage, um, the um, Greater Manchester Foundation Trusts. Um, and in fact, actually, at the joint um, meeting of um, um, CFOs and DOFs last week, um, there was a request came from um, the CFOs in Manchester to explore that option as well, which is, is terrific news. And that's something that we'll be building on um, over the, um, the, the next sort of week or so. So subject to um, sort of the, the, the road show that it feels like I'm on at the minute through, through all of the sort of boards, um, once we've, um, we, we've been able to get sort of endorsement for, 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 for the process um, and an agreement that we are moving in the right direction, we'll start then um, the, the sort of soft transition of GMSS um, and ELFs through into the, um, the, the corporate services delivery vehicle. Uh, to be fair, I think, I think we'll need to spend a bit of time thinking of a better name for it and maybe we'll uh, offer out some M&S vouchers to uh, the staff to come up with a, a sort of better name for it because uh, it doesn't really mean very much to, to, to anybody. Um, and um, the last two um, sort of sheets in the, the slide deck um, effectively set out the... Actually, no, I want to be there. <laughs> um, because what, what this um, is setting out is what we think the governance arrangements need to be um, for, the, for the, the, uh, the vehicle on day one and also on, um, if you like, day 366. Because what we're actually creating here is uh, effectively a provider of shared services. And what we need to make sure is that we don't uh, end up falling foul of any particular procurement regulations if we, when we start to um, um, sort of be in a position where, um, where, where organisations wish to, um, to sort of bring um, services into that particular vehicle. For instance, there's a negotiation ongoing at the minute with providers in Greater Manchester about creating um, a collaborative bank. And uh, we need to make sure that sort of that decision is not taken by the, the management team um, that's running the vehicle, that it is actually taken um, appropriately by um, what I, in this instance will be the uh, Provider Federation Board. So I just want to sort of make that clear that, um, you know, it will be a provider in the same way that um, other, other shared services providers um, are. Um, you can see through the paper that um, you know we've been through uh, various boards. 
Um, I'm not looking necessarily for um, approval to move forward. It's, it, it's essentially just endorsement of um, the, the, the sort of decision that was taken before and the work that we've moved on with um, to, to, to subsequently um, move forward on that decision. I'm not sure whether I've gone over five minutes or not, Tom, but I'll shut up at that point. <laughs> How much money will we save? Um, we're, we're targeting a 2% reduction in um, operating costs um, from year three onwards. Sorry, um, the, the turnover of the vehicle will be approximately um, 35 million. So we're, we're looking at circa um, a million and a half. The investment model um, that we've, we've created will look to sort of uh, share some of that with the, um, the, the sort of equity stakeholders and elements of that will be returned as in to retained inside the, uh, the vehicle to be invested in service deliveries and reductions in unit costs um, for its client base. Okay, thanks. Jeff, where are you? Any, uh, Anthony? Yeah, uh, thanks, Steve. Um, I suppose it was just a question about assurance around the management of the transition, uh, because we all know that there was a pretty, there was a, a couple of quite unfortunate incidents in, in involving uh, particularly uh, staff employed by CCGs where we'd had expected GMSS to have undertaken employment checks, for example. Uh, now, um, in any transition of any vehicle from A host to B host, there will be risk. Uh, and I just wanted just to get a view as to how we were assuring ourselves that that risk was being managed appropriately. <laughs> Okay, um, you're absolutely right, Anthony. The um, uh, the issue, the first part of your your, your sort of question there, um, uh, you know, we've we've developed an action plan within GMSS for the um, you know, to make sure that those sorts of issues don't happen again. Uh, we boasted the management team, um, and we've actually um, employed a full time um, interim, as he is at this moment in time, managing director, and GMSS now has its own. Um, um, Chief Finance Officer, the um, performance of GMSS and the uh, uh, sort of holding to account effectively takes place through two through two routes. Currently, GMSS is hosted by Oldham CCG, so they follow all of the the sort of governance and scrutiny associated with that. Um, and actually, sort of um, performance is is uh, routinely scrutinised through the um, Corporate Services Board, which is part of Theme Four Governance, and it also is, is scrutinised through the Theme Four Executive Board, which is chaired by Steve Wilson and has Nikki O'Connor as uh, as another partnership exec. And we will be held to account by that board for the transition. We have a very very detailed transition plan, which will set out stage by stage um, what needs to be done and um, we will be doing the usuals in terms of ma managing risks, risk registers um, and delivery of, um, of, of, of the plan to the timetable. Thank you Stephen. Any other comments? No? Okay, thanks. Okay, so obviously this continues the direction of travel that we agreed uh, previously, towards the end of 2018, via CFOs, and indeed a presentation you gave to JCB a while back, Stephen. So thank you for that. So there's a number of recommendations. I don't propose to go through each of them in turn, but if we are all happy to uh, endorse those uh, recommendations, which are largely sort of operational, that was going to happen. Yep, everybody's happy. Okay, good. Thank, thank you, very, you much. very much for your support. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for attending. Um, so, uh, Rob, a uh, summary update from the JCB exec, which was held last month, please. Yep. Thanks, Tom. So, I'm happy to take this report as read. It's just a piece of process to make sure that the executive is feeding back to the full board in the proper way. So, just asking members to note the report and confirming the actions and agreements that are set out therein. And happy to take any questions or comments, Tom, that anyone may have. Okay, so it's very much for noting. Um, any comments in terms of the JCB exec? 
No, okay, thank you for your report, Rob. Um, noted. Uh, Margaret, your uh, director's commissioning report, please, again, if you can keep, pick out any key points you want to make us aware of. Thank you, Chair. So um, the report sets out the kind of range of uh, areas that's been uh, under the oversight of Directors Commissioning over the last few months. Um, probably three points that I'd bring to your attention. I think firstly, the, um, the work that the effective use of resources uh, team does um, and the policies that Directors Commissioning have supported under the governance agreed by the JCB. I think one of the things there is that's about getting common standards across and a common offer across the conurbation. Um, probably where there is work to do, however, is how we implement and police that across our providers. So I think there is variation there in work to do. Um, and I think the other thing that on that is around the Cl Clinical Standards Board um, the work that's going on there around um, the, the significant savings that they've identified and continue to identify through switching of drugs which are equally effective. And I put in the report some of the savings that uh, that group has overseen, if you like, um, uh, in terms of the work it's done around that. Second bit, obviously, that we've done a quite a lot of work on is neuro rehab. We won't say anything more about that because of the earlier conversation, but certainly all the specifications have been through directors of commissioning, and um, they continue to have oversight, if you like, on the points that were made earlier around um, the community offer. And um, uh, you can see from, from the, the report that there's quite a lot of variation. So we'll continue to, to look at that and to see how we can support each other, and we'll take on board the point around um, the... Uh, um, uh, everybody trying to access get scarce uh, skill sets as we develop and embolder our community offer for neuro rehab. And then I think the third thing to, to mention is the commissioning review. So there's two two elements of that that directors of commissioning have been actively involved in over the last few months and will continue to do. Firstly is um, a little bit of navel gazing about how do we become strategic placed um, uh, strategic commissioners for the future, um, looking at commissioning uh, for our population and um, at a place. So we've done some work on that. We're continuing to do that. Um, we do recognise that across the 10 localities, we're all at different points in that transition and in that journey. Um, and But we do think we can get to a place whereby we can get um, some commonality of view moving forward to move away from a lot of the collaborative commissioning that we have oversight for, and that will still need to be done, but to raise our levels up to strategic commissioning. Um, and in that, I'm discussing having conversations with the chairs of uh, children's social services and adult social services who I'm assuming are having the same conversations and we can see um, what we can do to bring that together. So that's one thing that I'm hoping will be, um, will develop over the next few months and um, we'll be able to report in my next highlight report. And then the other subset of that is around one of the other recommendations of uh, the commissioning review which was a challenge to see what we could do um, at sort of once across acute services commissioning and directors of commissioning are working with Steve and chief finance officers to look at what the options there are. And some, of, some fairly radical things are coming out at the moment. So again, we'll work that up and hopefully chair um, will be able to provide some more detailed um, proposals, which uh, I can incorporate in my next highlight report to the JCB. Okay, thank you, Margaret, for that. Stephen, you want to come in? So, so just, um, well, so, so, Margaret, thank you for that report. Um, it, it just strikes me in just reflecting upon what you've described. It's critical that actually we make sure that the work of the directors of commissioning is aligned and supporting the work of this group. Uh, and I just wonder um, if we could just have a bit of a reflective piece about how we could do that as effectively as we could between, you, between Rob and yourself, actually. Um, you know, it's about understanding how you're taking work forward, but actually this, this, this group is actually um, uh, considering, but then particularly around thinking about a forward plan for this board and then how that's been supported through Directors of Commission. It just would be brilliant if we could actually start to sort of map that more formally, I think. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Helpful suggestion noted. Any other comments? Noreen. Um, yeah, I wanted to make a very similar point, really, but um, I was just going to use the example of CHC. Um, so, um, you know, I would particularly like to see a report back here on, on CHC. I'm sure we're all doing a lot in our localities on CHC. It's clearly a sort of ripe for integration work across, uh, you know, our, our partners in, the, in between CCGs and local authorities. 
but also mm -hmm. how it's how we're bringing in our directors of nursing in that who often lead in that sphere as well. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, you know, so it is that kind of work plan thing about what, what priorities and what are the critical issues. We know what are levels of expenditure on CHC, you know, it's a massive part of our budgets and so on. So it's, you know, for us, it's an absolute key priority. I'm sure it is for many other areas. So I would like to sort of see what actually specific pieces and apologies if that's kind of from somewhere else in our work plan. I just can't quite remember, but just to, to illustrate that point. Okay, thank you, Noreen. Noted. And uh, for members of the public watching live on the stream, CHC is c continuing healthcare. Sorry, just very, just very quickly to respond to, to the, both of those points, really. Just on, on the continuing healthcare piece, um, we've just kicked off a GM level review of that, and, and, and Noreen, Jasmine, Corbell, and Susan Beer are part of that work. And I've just also had an invite, for, uh, uh, an offer from. Uh, Andy Nuttall as well to get involved from Stockport. So Stockport well represents in a GM piece of work and more of which will come initially through directors of commissioning but then into here. So that, that, that's moving forward exactly as you describe and I think that's really important. And, and picking up the, the broader point and, and, and Stephen's point, I think the opportunity that we've got through this commissioning leadership group that the accountable officers group that we're about to establish linked into a, a broadened, st more strategic directors of commissioning function gives us the chance to do exactly what Stephen said and I think that needs to be very much led through that process but making sure that that comes back here for the whole system to approve, sign off, challenge and monitor as appropriate. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Anthony? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, it was just, uh, I suppose, a reflection on the reference in the paper to urgent care. Um, I think it would be slightly odd if we didn't mention the current position that we all face across Greater Manchester in, in respect of uh, urgent care and urgent care performance in particular, where I think every system uh, is under a significant amount of scrutiny uh, around uh, performance against the four-hour A&E standard. Um, I think perhaps it might be helpful for us to reflect on how we ensure that the work of the urgent and emergency care uh, delivery and improvement board is reflected back up to the JCB because there is a huge amount of work going on um, both in localities and at a Greater Manchester level. But I think one of the things that we might want to reflect on, and I think it also sings to the reference to the Cancer Board, actually, as well, in the Director of Com Commissioning paper, is how we can ensure that, whilst we don't duplicate the performance management mechanisms that are already in play, that we acknowledge that there is there are some very significant performance pressures in our system on which uh, the JCB, the Joint Commissioning Board, should have a, a role and view. Uh, so it's just just, just a, a bit of uh, reflection there. And I'm happy to bring something on urgent care as I chair that jointly with uh, Andrew Foster from Wigan. Okay, uh, thanks, Anthony. I think that's a good point. And also you could widen this out to other areas, including mental health, couldn't we? So we do need to think about how, J how JCB is kept cited on key areas because um, we haven't mentioned urgent care up until then, but of course it is one of the biggest challenges that our system currently faces. With permission, I will move us on. Thank you, Margaret, for your report. It's duly noted. Um, some key points, I think, for Rob and I to take away and work through. Um, so in terms of summary from today's meeting, so we managed to get through quarter to four, which is quite good. Um, three key points. So um, the first is that I think we've made a significant decision around investment in homeless care, and in particular, phase two of a bed every night. This is a real test, as Andy likes to say, of devolution and public service reform. Um, and we've shown our commitment to working uh, closely with colleagues uh, across the combined authority, et cetera. So a really important decision taken there. And we've um, approved the full business case for neuro rehab, which is uh, great news. And Steve, you can retire a happy man now. <laughs> uh, well done, your work is done <laughs> for today until tomorrow morning when we expect you back in. Um, and uh, the final thing to say is that um, You'll remember from our last full JCB that this meeting is now going to meet every two months. So we will be meeting again in July, September, November, January. So just make sure those dates are in your diaries because I think it's great to have such good level of attendance um, and long may that continue. And obviously the JCB executive will meet in between. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you all again in July. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.